Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Doctors of Running Virtual <laughs> Roundtable, where we three docs, physical therapy, and a cat. See you later. Um, there's a cat. For those of you on podcast, there's a cat on Matt's shoulder to start. Uh, <laughs> we discuss the art and the science to the stuff that we are putting on our feet. This episode is not sponsored by uh, Mango LaCroix and also the Packers getting the number one seed in the NFC for the playoffs. Go Pack Go! and um, likely an Aaron Rodgers MVP for the season. Also, Cowboys officially eliminated oh, from get out of playoff, con- <laughs> <laughs> playoff contention. Well, how many seconds I'm in are we already talking crap? Yeah, this is good. <laughs> oh, 2021. No, this should be a fun day. We are going to be covering a lot of different topics. I actually, so my son got a little easel for Christmas. Forgive me, I'm moving the screen here. But we have an easel. So here is our lineup for the night. We're going to talk about 2020 recap for Doctors of Running. Then we're going to jump into some dreams for 2021 that we have as a team and individuals. And then we are going to give a couple hundred plus mile updates to a couple of the shoes that we've put a lot of miles on kind of a durability and feel update. And then we're going to end with a little fun conversation on levels of evidence and how we make our recommendations for different people and, and uh, where we come up with this stuff and what, how you should interpret our recommendations. So this should be a really fun night tonight. Um, so let's, let's get started. Uh, let's start with the 2020 recap. Just really quick, it's been a fun year for us. Um, we've had, we had over 70 reviews, I think 72 different shoes we reviewed compared to a year ago, I think we're at 40. And so our partnership with companies has grown, which is due thanks to anybody who's paying attention and, and listening and following what we're doing and engaging in conversation with us. Um, we've, we've grown a lot in terms of our partnerships and that's thanks to, uh, you guys listening and, and hanging out with us. Um, we have started this YouTube and podcast and created over 30 episodes, uh, which has really been a fun thing for us to do. I feel like we've learned and grown a lot just by talking. Uh, and yeah, our website has, has, has grown and we've started doing some apparel reviews as well. So um, yeah, it's been a really fun year for us cumulatively. Uh, and we've also been able to have some conversations with product development teams with different shoe companies. So we've been able to talk about uh, what we're seeing clinically and what they're producing with the teams that are developing footwear. So again, all around super fun year for us. Uh, but now let's talk about on an individual level. Um, we'll all kind of go th- through this, but Matt or, or David, what was one goal that you accomplished this year in running? Uh, or what was uh, just one thing that you're reflecting on from 2020? David, go first. <laughs> oh man, that's a heavy question, man. I know. It's a- such a big year too. Yeah, I guess, I mean, 2020 was supposed to kind of be my year coming back into competitive running. And unfortunately didn't get very many cracks at it. I was happy to run at USA cross at the beginning of the year. That was about my only competition really besides some really, really small local stuff. Um, and then some time trials recently, but um, I think just to develop as a runner and to kind of fall in love with the sport again and to really kind of just not focus on racing entirely, but to just focus on getting better at running. I think mentally, physically, and just kind of growing um, and following the process. And I mean, it's been really exciting since moving to Santa Barbara. I mean, I've linked up with coach Terry Howell and, um, we've, I'm with a great group of people out here and a lot of fantastic athletes, and I'm just happy to be a part of it and kind of go along for the ride now at this point. So I know we'll go into 2021 later, but I think at this point, it's just been kind of like, if we want to talk in terms of energy, it's like a potential energy growing into kinetic energy, hopefully in the 2021. So (laughs) Love it. <laughs> no pressure on David, but if you go follow his Strava, there's been some very inspiring workouts and it's been very fun to watch this as well. Um, especially from, cause when I met you, you were not running at all. And now to watch you progress this level, you're doing <laughs> workouts where I'm like, this guy's going to kill the trials. He is going to qualify and this is going to be awesome. Like it's, it's, it's very cool to watch this. And so it's inspiring. And so again, if you have a chance to look at some of the stuff he's doing, 
Uh, no pressure, David, but it's very, it's. <laughs> Thank <awesome>. you. <laughs> totally. All right, Matt, your turn. So running goals, right? Or just general? Uh, what did you say? You said 20, just 20. Like, what, running? Yeah, running goals are something you reflected on from 2020. Running and, and or not running. 2020 was, I, for yeah, it was insane, right? There's so much stuff that happened. Um, for me personally, it was actually an insanely busy year. Um, I am, for those of you know, I'm still full-time as a PhD student. I am in clinic. I've been teaching at a bunch of different, like a couple different universities and trying to manage all that has been challenging, but through it all, my biggest running thing was just to not stop was to keep it up. And, uh, I actually managed to run 4,100 and I think 50 or 40 miles during this week. So I was able to basically maintain a minimum of like over 70 miles a week. And that was my goal is just to maintain stuff The the workouts I did, they were not sexy. I had several times I struggled just to get, you know, paces in there, but just staying consistent and gritting through stuff um, was my big goal. And I was able to do that. I'm super excited. I was still able to pace my fiance who has now shifted to doing trail running professionally and be able to shift to that. And so it's been a, a year of endurance and I am very proud to say I was able to, to hold on to that. Um, personally, I, I achieved one of my goals of being a faculty member or professor. So I'm now a professor at uh, Stanbridge university um, and I'm excited. I'm learning a ton uh, working with physical therapy assistant students and uh, it's been very cool. Haven't slowed down on the PhD. So again, just keeping up with things and, and gritting through stuff has been the major goal. And it was, I was able to, keep that going and just having an incredible group of people to work with on doctors of running. I think, you know, just having, watching these guys grow, bringing Bach on, which shout out to Bach, who's our new amazing Uh, behind the scenes, like social media guy. So all the stuff you see is from him. He is amazing. I am so honored that he joined us and has been such an incredible experience to watch this grow. And uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm very thankful for everyone that, that, watches and listens and super thankful for the all these wonderful people that are with us on this and other mini yeah. shout out for Bach. check out the the nonprofits that he works for as well you can just check out his stuff and if you especially in, if you're in south carolina and in, in his area anyway this he is also, also for the Bach. best is also Loading for Bach, what i am those. holding up <laughs> <laughs> so this one's for you Bach. taroko <laughs> <laughs> For those listening, David held up a Taroko. Uh, there's a big inside joke. So literally nobody gets it except us. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that. Um, that's great. <laughs> no, thanks for sharing, guys. I think for me, um, uh, in the running world, I think the big goal that I accomplished <clears throat> was my half marathon. I've been trying to break the hour and a half. I've talked about this before, but yep. tried to break the hour and a half mark two other times and I've, I failed both of those. I ran a one thirty four eleven, and then the other one I ran a one forty four something. So I totally, it was a, it was a crazy day, not a good day. Um, and then I finally went down. It was the, the week, the week of my half marathon was the week everything shut down. And so literally three days before they canceled the in-person event. So it became virtual three days before the event. Cause it was in March. And I ran in these guys, and uh, this is the Speed Elite, Skechers Speed Elite. And so, for those of you who saw our picks for Shoes of the Year, this was my pick and Matt's pick for yep. Racing Shoe of the Year, which is potentially, to many, an odd pick. Part of my pick was the personal connection of finally achieving that goal of breaking an hour and a half. And so, um, so yeah, that was a running-related goal. That was fun. Uh, I had a lot of uh, health stuff this year that came up, um, <clears throat> both that took me out of running, some that I'm going to eventually likely need surgery for, um, whether now or in like 15 or 20 years. Um, so I think take, you know, and then I also uh, had COVID. And so that, that and that's still something that's affecting me. And I think this brings me to my other part. Uh, if, if 2020 taught, if we've been paying attention, <laughs> if it taught us anything, one of the things that it taught us is uh, the amount of control that we actually have around in the things that we have is way lower than we, than we thought. Um, and so I've just been processing through what it means to not have as much control as I thought I did. 
in my life and in the world around me. And I read a book uh, a while back. This was like a year, it was like a year and a half ago. So it kind of prepped me for 2020, I guess. Um, but two of the things in that book was um, life is not meant to be mastered, but enjoyed. And when you let go of that mastery of life and, and enjoy those things that you get to be a part of it also choosing to enjoy it allows you to free you up to live your life for the sake of other other people and being generous and giving so just a really good book and i think it prepped me for what 2020 had so running in life kind of coming together as it usually does and, and let's look forward to 2021 what do you guys what would you guys say are your goals for for doctors of running maybe matt you can speak to that first Kind of what's your goal for 2021 with Doctors of Running? And then what would you guys say is a goal that you have, uh, a dream? I put dreams on the board. I should probably stay consistent with my vernacular. I think one of my goals for 2021, obviously, is to keep going with the pace that we're doing, right? So the number of view, reviews, to be able to contact with a couple other companies, to start working a little deeply with the, the ones that we have good relationships with. But I think especially a goal is to start bringing a little bit more of the evidence or make people more aware of the lack thereof behind some of this stuff. So in the past, I've written on some kind of running movement impairments and I'd like to be able to add a little bit more. Cause again, the goal of this website is really as a teaching platform to help educate people about going, this is stuff you need to be, to be aware of. Here's what evidence does exist. Here's what doesn't. Um, so I hope to be able to pull that in our niche as a scientific website and educational website to kind of keep growing that in our unique place mm -hmm. in doing running shoe and uh, like in running uh education and, and review yeah awesome i love it dave what about you yeah i agree completely i think with 2020 a big thing was just building our platform and quite literally growing doctors of running to where we are not necessarily a household name i don't think we're that but in terms of the running <laughs> world I mean, just having a bigger presence so that our content can get to more people and I think that we have accomplished that. And I think now that we are being able to see and spread all this knowledge so much more efficiently to so much more people, I think now it's kind of like the year to really buckle down on what we founded this thing on in the first place, which is exactly getting all of that knowledge and everything that we know and have learned to people and give them a resource to turn to whether that be biomechanics or footwear science, or even what we were even talking about, like common impairments within running or um, strength and conditioning, all that, all the fun stuff that we kind of envisioned at the very beginning, I think um, we can kind of start to put into more fruition, I think. And I'm pretty excited for that. Awesome. And I, uh, I'm not going to add on to that too much because I agree there. Um, I think one of the things that we hope to do as a team and a goal is to bring uh, we've kind of, if you've looked at our most recent reviews, you've seen our, our layout has changed a little bit and there's some good thought and conversation that, that went behind changing it. One of the things that we kind of took out a little bit that will still be talked about is durability because, uh, in testing 70 some shoes this year, um, that means, you know, we, we put all of our shoes through certain types of runs and a certain number of miles. And that allows us uh, to get a good enough grip to talk about the shoe on a lot of topics. One, it doesn't give us the best is durability. What we have been giving is what we would call projected durability based on the compound that it's made out of and what we've seen in other shoes with that compound, et cetera, et cetera. But something we're excited to do next this in this year, a little bit more is having certain shoes that we dedicate to bringing up to 100, 200 miles and giving you guys feedback from a durability standpoint of real mileage on a shoe where you're getting, uh, getting that in there. So, um, Matt put an update for one shoe already on the website, but we're going to talk about it again today. We're going to talk about three shoes. Uh, and this is kind of a segue into number three. I called it hundred mile updates, but it's even more than that, more than hundred miles for some. So, um, let's talk about three shoes today that we've gotten over hundred miles on and just give an update on how they are doing. What's the update review with that? Sure. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll go first. Great. Client is the destroyer. So I think if any shoe lasts beyond a hundred miles, I think you, you're in a pretty good spot there <laughs> with, with, with Matt, but 
one of those actually being the endorphin speed. So I think this has been a pretty tried and uh, true tested shoe, I think, am amongst the masses with how popular the shoe is. Um, the outsole is totally fine. Like, like, there's some wear at the posterior lateral heel, but, I mean, outsole is fine. Midsole feels great. I did a workout in it yesterday, and I have oh, about 125 miles roughly on it right, right now. Uh, nice. The how, uh, uh, would you say the bounciness is the, is the same for the speed? Did that change at all? Yeah, uh, it's the same. It, it's the same. It feels like it's brand new. In all honesty, it feels good as new. Yeah, awesome. I mean – maybe a tiny bit of grippiness on the outsole but besides that it's it's solid nice um the addy zero pro i have 96 miles on so not quite 100 but can't talk about it can't talk, can't talk about, about it, it. didn't quite I'm just the kidding. Mark. but <laughs> same thing here good as new absolutely the boost i mean boost is proven i mean that's what that seems to never destruct and the light strikes doing well the plate feels good outsoles absolutely no blemish on the outsole and then mm -hmm. i know you're going to talk about the one that um i'll be talking we'll come about back we'll bit. come back to you for that yeah we'll come back around we'll circle back but yeah awesome i'll go next then just to the one that i've got it was my trainer of the year um the symmetros from reebok uh, i have just over 100 miles on this guy and uh, it, it's been super consistent with other Reebok shoes where the outsole is just the best rubber. It's just as grippy as it's ever been. Um, and this is, it, it's thicker than the other rubbers they've put on their other shoes, like the float rate energy. Um, so the rubber on the outside is, is really good. I have, you can still see the, the like mini ridges on top of these. You can kind of see there's some tread here. There's mini ridges on top that were put in originally. And in most places, it's that's even still there. A little bit of minor wear, minor wear where I toe off on the inside. Um, let's see if I can show you guys that. Yeah, so just a little, and you can't even tell, but a little bit of minor wear where I'm pushing off there. And then in the heel, or honestly, the heel, I don't even have anywhere on the posterior lateral side, which, which is where I land. Um, and then the foam, uh, I love, so I feel like float rate energy foam, from zero to 25 feels firm. After that, it feels great and it still feels great. Um, I know that when I, in my float ride energy, the version one, I had over hundred miles on those and I felt like it flattened out in the forefoot and I don't have that happening in the Symmetros. It's felt really good and really smooth. Um, still feels fresh for my long runs and softer than day one, which I like a little bit. Upper is good. No, no tearing on the upper at all. I'd like it to didn't second, stretch at all. I'd like to second those comments on the durability. I don't have my Symmetros anymore because uh, the queen of this household ensured that I get rid of some shoes at certain points in the year. So I had to give those away. Um, but I, I don't have my pair. But again, even after 100 miles, which I did get on them, the outsole was still intact, which for as these guys will tell you is very rare. And so because I will rip through outsole. He has sent but, me shoes at... He has sent me shoes at 35 that have had no outsole. Yeah, that I've literally torn oh, yeah. the outsole and the uh, midsole is exposed. It's already yeah. happened. A6 Nimbus Light too. Yeah. Hey, that's I still was, doing okay. They were already biting into the midsole already. And then he gets defensive about it when he gets called I, out. I do get a little defensive. <laughs> it's, it's still doing fine. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you have to add about the Symmetros, David? I agree with everything you said. I mean, the outsole has shown virtually zero wear. Like, same exact thing. Like, maybe those tiny little ridges have smoothened out a tiny bit. But as far as the actual traction and rubber goes, it looks good as new. It feels good as new. If anything, it's been feeling better with time, like you said. Um, the Float Ride Energy Foam seems to get a little bit more bouncier, like softer and bouncier with time. It might have a little bit more give to it, like upon like landing. But besides that, I almost prefer that to when it's brand new. So I think if anything, mm -hmm. I've actually grown to like the shoe more as I have mm -hmm. ran in it. So, yeah. Yeah. And I also take it in trails. I shouldn't. <laughs> for the, uh, amazing, for I was... the listeners out there, there, my outsole is just covered in mud and dirt and sand. I was impressed how much traction that shoe had for having a relatively smooth outsole. I also was able to take it on trails without much 
problem. So I was I was really impressed by that. Yeah. We, we are starting. Sure. We are starting to remove, view more trail shoes, especially because I have more access to trails where I live now. And so we're, we're still beginning to learn some of the evidence and stuff behind, or the, the like stuff behind traction and what that means in a shoe. And so that's an area you'll see more in 2020. We'll start diving into more trail shoes. Yeah. All right, let's hit, let's hit your fave, your favorite shoe of the year by a million. Hey, what, uh, that's not oh, actually oh, true. You mean, yeah, oh, you're making fun of me. Okay. Um, I am a little bit. So just, I have a hundred like this shoe a lot. Yeah, I really do like this shoe. I, I am a little biased since I, I do tend to gravitate more towards stability stuff. I don't mm. like maximal stability shoes, which is why I've been amazed that this shoe and the hurricane 23 have actually worked very well for me. Um, yeah. but I have to, I have to say that with time, this, this is, is the, this is the light. light. Yes. So they, this is kind of like, this is the modern day kind of like, sexier version of the Keanu for if you want to pick up the pace a little bit. And what I found over the mileage is when I first had this shoe, it was super snappy and I could use it for workouts. The right is definitely softened a little bit, but the outsole is still like it's there. That's all I can say is usually I would have gone through an outsole at this point, but both there's a little more wear at the forefoot, but it's still good. The upper has remained. Uh, How many miles? I have 180. 180 miles. Yeah. So the upper has remained kind of a little bit, it fits a little bit wider, but it's still secure. Like I, again, have never needed to lace lock this shoe. Uh, it's certainly, the flight foam has firmed up a little bit with time, but it's not bad. It's still stable. I can still feel the stability elements. I don't think feel like things are breaking down, but it's still custom to me where I'm not like, oh, this is getting more stiff as I run in it. It's like, yeah, the sole's a little firmer, but it's still pretty consistent. I'm very impressed with this shoe. So slightly less snappy. Yeah. Slightly more firm. Hasn't right. changed in its stability mechanism. Like it, no. it didn't. It didn't cut, flatten out in that way. Not at um, all. It, it's just more of a trainer than it was a really performance level shoe. Right. After 180. Yeah. Exactly. And I think a lot of, like I said in the review, I early on a lot of people will be able to use this if you run in in shoes like the Hurricane or the Keanu. Um, you're going to be able to use this as a workout shoe and it's going to, the workout esque stuff is going to last kind of as long as a normal racing flat would. And then after that, it's going to be a trainer. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, you guys can keep an eye out. We have, like I said, Matt updated the review of the Keanu light to have our durability update in there. So you can go on our website and check that out and see his written version. And we might even produce separate reviews with kind of short updates um, for these durability reviews. Um, and you guys can give us feedback if that's something that you would like. Um, and if you'd want that in video form like this, or uh, cause we could do short videos for that too. So just, we would take your feedback on yep. that, but we definitely want to bring shoes through lots of paces, um, not just our standard protocol for right. testing. So we are excited to continue to do that. We do take your feedback uh, very seriously, by the way. So if you have it, it is very yes. helpful. We do integrate it. We had a whole meeting at the end of the year trying to look back at that. So it is helpful to us. So thank you. Yeah. And just for our fans, I just want to say thank you for the continued support and engagement specifically because yeah, we do listen, we do read and we do respond. And yeah. so everything that you send, it all makes us better every single day. So yep. keep it up. I agree. <laughs> Two other quick shout outs or another shout out, at least one, maybe I forgot the other, but um, it's been fun. We, we established um, kind of some partnership with Fleet Feet this year. Um, and they, the cool thing about their online ordering platform is that if you order a shoe online and they ship nationwide in the United States, um, they fulfill that over 90% of the time through a local store. So even if you can't go to the store or you don't have a fleet feet by you, the closest store that has your size of the shoe you want in stock gets the benefit of that. So you're supporting a, lo a local business somewhere. Um, and that's just a pretty cool thing. And then you may have seen, we had the, they sponsored some giveaways for us through December leading up to the holidays. So that was really, that was really fun. So thanks to fleet feet. Um, and we got some more partnerships coming up this year too. So you guys can keep an eye out. We'll, we'll have links on our website too. Um, and even maybe in videos, I don't know if we can do that to purchase shoes uh, that we review, if that's what you're planning to do. And by doing that, you do support our work as well, um, which is pretty fun. We didn't think we'd ever do that, but that's pretty awesome. 
we, we gotta get uh, Jamie back on that one because he does that. He does those uh, the the links really well in his videos. So we'll have to learn from him how he does that. Yeah, we should talk to. Yeah, we'll just have him on and talk about that and teach us. Um, okay, we are into our final segment for tonight. We're going to be talking about levels of evidence, and the reason we want to talk about levels of evidence, and we'll define this more, uh, is. We, on this site, we're giving analysis of footwear um, and runners and injuries and a lot of this stuff. Uh, and so, and then we give recommendations and we want you guys to understand what our recommendations really mean and how you should interpret them. And, you know, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but I'm going to show you guys a pyramid um, that kind of is a, is a general breakdown of what, what the different quote levels of evidence are. And when people say, Oh, it's in the research kind of what that means. And so this, this pyramid is kind of uh, what can, what is known as the hierarchy of evidence at the top, the highest level of evidence is a systematic review or meta analysis, um, which means that they take a bunch of studies together and they take all the results and summarize them uh, based on common denominators. Just below that is randomized controlled trials. We'll talk about that later. And it keeps going down the list to smaller and smaller studies that have less um, power behind the recommendations until you get all the way to this bottom base, um, which is expert opinion in editorials. And so uh, we're going to talk about where things, uh, that was pretty clutch. For those of you who are listening, Matt, <laughs> Just sneeze and he muted his mic right before he sneezed. That was awesome. Uh, anyway, so we're going to kind of break down uh, a little bit of, of what these mean in terms of recommendations and where we come in on this, on this scale. So I hope that all made sense. But um, Matt, you're the PhD student here. You're sitting, in, you're sitting in doing and learning about how to conduct research the most. Can you just help us understand what a randomized controlled trial is? One, um, if you have an example, example of a running related randomized controlled trial uh, and then we'll go from there. So a randomized controlled trial is where you have groups that you're you so let's say you have let's say you have a carbon fiber shoe group versus a non-carbon fiber shoe group right so you you randomize the subjects that you get into each group you do not bias them one way or another and you, the one is group is going to serve as a control Right, so this is the normal group that you have to go ahead hey, versus your intervention group. So the intervention is a carbon fiber plate. The control group is the non-carbon fiber plate shoe. The reason you have each of these is to make sure that the effect that you're seeing in the intervention group is actually different than a control group. Because if you see an effect, oh, hey, this carbon fiber group improved their performance by this amount. If the control group also improved the same amount, you know that that, that effect has, has, is coming from somewhere else. It's not the, the differentiation. So that's why making sure you randomize people because if you randomize them you know that you are not creating any bias results and having a control group also lets you know yes this effect if we do see one and it's different this is a meaningful effect so having randomization control there are very stand these are this this takes out a lot of biases and room for error in this research so it, you're more confident with the results you get I, doing these is another story. It is really hard to do randomized control trials because you need a large number of patients. You need to make sure things are randomized. You need to make sure there's no bias. It's it's very hard to do these. There are you not need to start with <coughs> you need to start with homogenous groups. Like you can't yes, have right. too much diversity in your right. group in terms of like a 20 year old and an 80 year old might not respond the same to whatever right. you know whatever it is. So you got to start here until you have more results right you got to keep your group smaller or like more homogenous right and so mo there are actually not a ton of randomized control trials when it comes to running footwear most of the randomized control trials that were done and you, you know i need to go review these because it's been it's been a minute since i've looked at these studies now that with this different view um a lot of the rcts that were done uh, previously if i remember correctly please correct me if i'm wrong has more to do with stuff that the military has done um, in terms of like the studies are going, does, does prescribing a shoe based on arch type uh, have any influence on injury risk? And the answer is no, but they had enough subjects that they could do something like that. And it was homogenous enough that they could do it. A lot of the other footwear research is nowhere near that. You're going to see 10 subjects. It's whoever's was available, right? So it's the cross country team or the, just whatever you had. And they are very small. We're looking at more like, 
cohort studies and these small cohort studies. studies. So there is not a lot of RCTs when it comes to running footwear. That's just the way it is. So having yeah. really specific yeah. evidence, there's not a ton of it, right? There's a lot of expert opinion out there. That's, that's a lot of times what, when we say things theoretically, that's what that is. But RCT is not so much. There are some, there are a couple systematic reviews, but you have to realize systematic reviews are bringing, all, <laughs> excuse me, all the available evidence together. And most of the time they are bringing to their, the systematic review is only as strong as the evidence, the studies that they use. So a lot of times it is still single subject things or cohort studies. So that even those are not very strong. Just to realize that a lot of the evidence for running footwear, we don't have a ton of it. It doesn't mean it isn't strong. It just means we don't have a ton of it at the moment because most of it is done by private companies and, and companies that don't want their information shared. So we kind of have to do trial by fire and that's where that's what you have to realize that research isn't the only thing. It's very important. It is very important. But there's when I when we teach students and what, what the three of us go by is there are three pillars of evidence to clinical practice. One of them is research and knowing, hey, this is what the evidence says is important. However, sometimes there isn't evidence on that subject. Right. So a lot of, we've had some controversial comments on some of the long term effects of using or training only in carbon fiber shoes versus non carbon fiber shoes. There's no research on that. Yeah. The only research that's been done has been acute effects, like a few minutes at most. No one's done even a six week or eight week follow up or months that it hasn't been done yet. If it's in progress, we don't know about it. Hopefully they publish it. Companies might have that information, but they are definitely not sharing that because that's proprietary because it's specific to their shoe. Now, for us yeah. to be able to figure that out, there are two other pillars of evidence. One of them is our clinical experience. So we've all been clinicians for some time. When you see things over and over again, you start taking in that information, right? You have to check yourself because there's always a risk of bias there. But seeing things repeatedly and being able to experience, go, oh, this is what happened with this is important. The other really important one is the patient or in this case, the customer experience. Sometimes things just don't match, right? You have these three pillars for a reason because you're trying to use the available information from each one of these to the best of your ability. And you know what? Personal preference certainly affects this. I have plenty of people that go, I prefer to run an issue and I'm looking at their mechanics and going, your mechanics are a mess. But you've run in this type of shoe and you've never had an injury. And we've tried to, and you've, we've tried to put you in a different shoe and it made it worse. This is where a personal preference comes into play. And it's not to say that that's not the only thing. Each of these integrate together, but that's where patient preference and experience comes in. So these three things you have to integrate together to really make the best decisions. And that's how we base all of our decisions and the stuff we write about going. It's trying to integrate all these things. That's why sometimes people ask like, hey, what about this? I'm like, it depends. It depends on what limited evidence we have. It depends on our clinical experience. And then it depends on you. You know, you are also an important variable. So there, there's there's all kinds of things that come into this. That's, you know, that's what makes this really fun, but also extremely challenging because there's so many variables. Yeah. Right. And, and that, controlling the variables. I mean, when you have so many qualitative and quantitative variables clashing, I think that also makes it very difficult for a footwear science type of study. Because that's what I, I kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit as well. Just taking a look at a lot of these studies, uh, just looking at the limitations, the funding, the sample sizes, the type of resources they have available to even conduct some of these. And a lot of them are very short in duration, small sample sizes. If you're looking for quote unquote credibility, it's not quite there, but it's the best thing we have in some situations. And so it's, you kind of have to take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. And it's most of the, in the running world, most of the randomized controlled trials that I have personally seen, been a part of, experienced, presented, whatever, it's usually been around the exercise physiology realm. And the reason why is because you can have quantitative variables attached. It's like you can have VO2 max, lactate threshold, um, just blood lactate levels over time, you know, whatever steady state, whatever, whatever you want to look at, you can look at physiological parameters and then standardize it to the individual person and then randomize whatever intervention you're trying to incorporate. <laughs> but in the situation with footwear, it's not so simple. And that's where you have so many confounding variables all kind of clashing together in the same body. It's, it's hard to have good, solid, 
research, you know, I don't want to say quantitative because there is a certain aspect of qualitative research as well that's very helpful and I, I think beneficial, but it's, it's hard to bridge the two and to create a truly randomized controlled trial, let alone a systematic review of a bunch of those. So it's hard to say without a doubt on anything, especially in the footwear world and with long-term duration on top of that. So it's, it's kind of like the wild west right now in the footwear industry. And like I said, just take everything with a grain of salt and the personal human experience is probably going to be the, the most leading factor at this moment um, for most people. So, yeah. And I, I think there's a reason that we, we kind of chose our words carefully where we, where we always say the art and the science, because we are talking about the science um, where there are randomized control studies and cohort studies um, related to footwear, but also related to what we know about injury risk. So different people who have um, certain comorbidities or certain mechanics or whatever have been shown to have more injuries. You know, somebody who has <laughs> decreased hamstring length might be more likely I think it's six times more likely to develop plantar fasciitis or plantar fascia pain. I should have said fasciitis, forgive me. Um, but developing plantar fascia pain. So there's things like that that have been studied um, with randomized control tests, but that has nothing to do with footwear. So we're bridging what we know about some of these science categories with the art that's implemented when it comes to developing footwear. So that's why we choose art and science, the stuff that we're putting on our feet. And a lot of, a lot of the stuff that we talk about comes from our clinical and expert opinion. Um, and it's really fun to think critically. I think this is one of those things in our jobs that we have to do every day. Because believe it or not, there's a lot less in medicine that has a million randomized controlled trials that create systematic reviews than you'd think. Even things that happen all the time, like rotator cuff repairs, there's like to, to know how, how early should you move a shoulder, nobody cares about this, but how early should you move a shoulder after a rotator cuff repair? The answer yeah. is still, we don't know. And that right. happens all the You'll time. It happens protocols. all the time. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's the studies aren't conclusive. And so- so what do you do? Do you not get a recommendation from a healthcare provider? No, you get one based on their expert opinion in conjunction with their surgeon, because you know what surgery they did and you know what, how good that surgeon is. And you know, uh, kind of how things have come through from that surgeon in the past. And so you have to, that's what we get to do with this stuff is we get to kind of bridge that. Uh, what do we see clinically? What do we see with these shoes? And it's fun. It's fun. Super fun. Two comments on that. Notice that Nathan said it, it. You might. So when a lot of these things, a lot of the research that we've seen and that's been done, where it goes, you know what, this movement pattern or this component might put you at risk for an injury. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have it. It right. also doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be safe from it. There are other variables. Not just you know when people talk about just shoes, right? <coughs> Excuse me. This is not the only variable, right? When it comes to injury history, right? That's why. You know, some a certain company right now is making claims about a shoe that they say reduces injury risk. You can this is one variable. You are not talking about what the personal person's strength is or their training history or their resilience or any of the, their movement patterns. There's so many other things that go into this. So to make a definite statement like that, especially in a, a situation where they have they put an abstract but it was never published, and they, um, you can't make that definite claim. We can only really make suggestions going because each person is so complicated. Yeah, we're definitely never going to get a partnership with Nike now. Um, because, <laughs> because each person is so unique, you have to be able to look at them before you make a, a, a recommendation. It's still a recommendation because there's some things that we may not know. So the, um, and again, it, there's, there's, and people respond differently to the same thing just because that's like, for example, the rotator cuff stuff you know, if you're going to make a recommendation, you can't be like, oh, well, the evidence says this. You have to go, all right, what's this person I'm looking at who's had a rotator cuff tendon repair, how active are they, right? If it's a 25-year-old and they're a professional athlete and they're super active and they've got good strength coming in, they're, I'm going to mobilize them a lot earlier than somebody who is a 85-year-old with a 60-year history of tendon degeneration. That's going to be totally different, and you have to take that into account. That's where research does not do a great job of picking up those, those unique individual things about people, unless you're talking about, you know, case studies and case reports. But 
you have to realize that it's this is a lot more complicated. There is not the evidence is is there to help guide us, but it's not the only thing you have to integrate everything together and it's really hard it is really hard yeah. it's, it's one of the fun things about this profession and then you can always take it back day. to that yeah you can always take it back to that very first research class that anyone ever has and it's always mm -hmm. correlation does not necessarily mean causation right now you hear that over yeah. and over and over again it's beaten into you at any research program but yeah <laughs> so I think just to sum this up, you know, when you get to listen to what we have to say or you read what we have, we are making recommendations. And we do think critically about this. We don't just throw out our recommendations. And you'll probably notice that our recommendations uh, always carry a, uh, <laughs> it's funny, I it used to use the word always. Yeah. But they'll, they'll, they'll carry a, this may be something to consider. Just like what we talked about with, should you train in carbon fiber plates? Maybe. We don't know yet. Here's what we would recommend right now based on what, what would make sense with how that affects the foot or the knee or the ankle, et cetera. Um, and then the cool, the cool weird thing is that our recommendations might change as new evidence comes available. Because if you go back over a hundred years ago, the recommendation for blood pressure was that if you had buildup in your blood vessels, like if you had atherosclerosis or whatever, that you should get your systolic blood pressure above 200 because you need more pressure to push it past the blockages. That was the recommendation. <sighs> and that recommendation changed because new evidence became available. If you've been paying attention to 2020, when it comes to coronavirus recommendations are changing because new things are learned all the time. Maybe I'm talking too much, but that's <laughs> when you, when you read our recommendations, uh, you know, listen to it, you, you can listen to it and try to process it and then match it to your personal experience um, and uh, get in dialogue with us about it if you, if you have thoughts because we love thinking. Another so. good example of things that have changed, especially related to our world, is the whole concept of, of rice, of like after acute injury using rest, ice, elevation, compression. Um, that's totally changed. The physician that really made that recommendation with ice has totally gone back now that we know that a lot of times, first of all, ice and heat – don't use don't always make it deep enough to make it a change in the tissue and a lot of us we now know that ice typically tends to slow down healing and yeah that we want to be able to Same mobilize with. people as early as possible and get them moving so it's the new phrase phrase should be active rest compression a lot of this stuff and they they've taken out a lot of the just bed rest or just using ice because now we know hey we have evidence before through this we've learned that and things change. So now you'll see people going, no, don't use ice. You need to keep gently moving. I mean, this is going to take some time to heal, but <laughs> although there are plenty of people I still use yeah, ice I, with, but for different reasons. I think, yeah, I think just to top that off, cause I think that can be useful information. Um, yeah. The recommendations even after like, acute ankle sprains is to not do the icing and, and to not take anti-inflammatories until 48 hours, I believe after um, because what you want is our, our body responds to injury by sending blood and the blood carries a lot of healing factors. Man, he's sneezy McGee over there. I um, know. But he's muting every time. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty amazing. You just got that <laughs> thing on like the hot key or something. Gina just made but, dinner uh, and, she, and there's all this like stuff in the air right now. It's, it, it smells really awesome. I'm excited to eat this, but like I am choking on these fumes <laughs> right now. So I'm like sneezing every 20 seconds. Flirt. But anyway, here he goes again. Uh, so point, point is you want, you're going to want the blood flow to those areas. Icing, vasoconstricts, which means it decreases the size of the blood vessels and decreases the amount of blood that can go there. And then anti-inflammatories would take away inflammatory markers and inflammation is good for early healing. So that's why they take those away now early, um, which feels so counterintuitive yep. because it's just what we've done forever. But that we should, we should wrap up. We should wrap up. Um, any final thanks that you guys want to give out for this year? We're going to bring the K-12. David's holding up the Kinvara 12. We're going to bring the K-12. I think Matt's going to bring it to 150 or 200 or something. Um, I think that'll be a unique shoe just given the lack of outsole coverage and just see, see how it goes and see how the foam does. Um, yeah. I mean, I have over 50 on mine already. Like it'll hit a hundred pretty quick. Cause I do most oh. of my long runs in it. Oh, perfect. David might have that. Yeah. Have, so have, well, yeah, that'll be good. Then maybe David's going to do it either way. Somebody's going to do it. Any other things you guys want to say 
uh, to wrap up the year or start the new year? I, I'm super thankful, not only for, for you guys. And again, I say this every year that I'm super thankful that they joined me back in 2019. And then now we have Bach added on. I'm super thankful for all the, for everybody that's joined us on this journey, whether it's people from different footwear companies who have responded to us or reached out. Uh, I'm super thankful. God, just some of the conversations that we had this year with, with people and who would have thought that zoom would, would open up communication to be able to talk with people that behind some of the development of these shoes. So I'm super thankful for the companies and the people that join us with this. The viewer is, is somebody I'm in all of you. I'm very thankful for and appreciate joining us on this crazy journey as we try to figure out like, you know, we're all in search of that perfect shoe, right? I started this because I was looking for the perfect shoe and I wanted to give my thoughts and educate. And I never, I never knew it would go this, this far. And so I'm thankful every single day to still be doing this. So it's, it's really cool. Yeah, I agree. Let's end on that. Right. Thank you, Matt. Positive. And thank you to everybody who's, who's listening and uh, everybody who does partner with us and all the companies. So we appreciate y'all. And um, again, you can always follow us on Facebook, Instagram. We also have a Twitter account now um, where we'll be posting some stuff and it, that'll be fun. We'll be able to share from other people a little bit easier. Um, other scientists who are putting out good stuff in relation to running. So that'll be a good place to check out. Um, and our podcast, Doctors of Running Virtual Roundtable, and this YouTube channel if you're watching on here. So subscribe, like, whatever. Um, let us know if what we can do to interact with you guys more and uh, give you more of uh, what would be helpful uh, to hear from us. So hope you guys all have a great day, morning, night, whatever. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year.